How are you doing today? I'm Jed. And I'm Sequoia, and we're here in beautiful Dana Point, California. Today we're going to be talking about Red Tide. Throughout this program we're going to be answering questions like what is Red Tide, how, where, and when Red Tides occur. Is Red Tide toxic? And how Red Tide affects the public? We'll be answering these questions by interviewing a local surfer and also be talking to the Orange County Marine Institute here in Dana Point. Dana Point Harbor with local surfer Brian Weatherly. How are you doing today, Brian? I'm doing pretty well, thanks. So, Brian, how long have you been surfing off the California coast? Oh, it's been about 25 years now. Now, how does the red tide affect you? Well, it didn't used to affect me at all, but as I got older, I started having a pretty severe allergic reaction. Um, the water would build in my sinuses and I'd start to get a sinus infection and uh, wouldn't go away for several days. Okay. So nowadays when the red tide's around, I find myself staying out of the water. Um, whereas when I was younger, I didn't worry about it too much. Now has, over the years of surfing, has the amount of red tide increased or decreased? I seem to have noticed a large increase in the number of days that have red tide. Uh, in 2006, there was about a six-week stretch of really, really heavy red tide. And then in two, again, in 2007, we had about two months uh, in the springtime where the red tide was um, really, really strong and, and, and never let up. We're here at the Ocean Institute with Jonathan Witt, who's the Director of Environmental Studies. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you very much. Now, we came here to talk to you about red tide. So, yes. obviously, we're going to start off with the easiest question. What is red tide? What is red tide? Well, you know, it's an amazing natural phenomenon that is really an explosion of reproduction of particular types of phytoplankton in the ocean. Okay. Now, when does red tide usually occur? There really isn't, let's say, a set um, time of year, a set season. It can really happen at any time, at anywhere, basically in any ocean, along any coast. Um, the conditions just have to be right for this event to occur. Okay, and what kind of conditions are we looking at? Uh, there are several factors that um, you know, really facilitate these algal blooms, these red tide phenomenon. And again, knowing that they are naturally occurring, um, it's a combination usually of excess nutrient levels the right temperature and salinity in the ocean. Um, and oftentimes, because these are the plant plankton in the ocean, it could be, let's say, a decrease or, or the other biomass that is in the area. If there's low predation of these plant plankton, um, they're gonna have the opportunity to really reproduce and create these blooms as it's really known. Okay, now is red tide toxic to humans? It can be, um, and it's not to say that all of these um, phytoplankton, all of these diatoms and dinoflagellates um, that are part of this phenomenon are themselves toxic. Some are, some aren't. Some actually produce toxins or have their toxins build up in the organisms that are actually ingesting them, whether inadvertently. So um, there are some harmful effects to humans, definitely. Um, and it's usually in the case of swimmers in the ocean um, swimming through a red tide event and then also through um, the uh, seafood that we ingest. Okay, now what kind of seafood does it usually affect? Usually, um, the most uh, common species that are going to be affected by a red tide event are going to be fish and then our filter feeding um, invertebrates. You know, definitely filter feeders would include clams, oysters, um, because basically how they're feeding is you know, being stationary and letting the water filter through their system. So again, as they filter the water, they're taking in anything and everything that is in that, uh, in that water. Uh, oh, sorry. Fish, again, kind of same process as they're swimming through and breathing and having the water run over their gills, they can be, um, again, directly affected. Okay. Now, what causes the color in red tide? The color, you know, there isn't um, 
a direct connection. It's, again, it could be a combination of several factors. Um, one is definitely the scattering of visible light. You know, we know, again, by the, the many colors of the oceans, whether it's a deep, rich blue or sort of a green color, even the red, um, can come from a variety of factors. Sometimes it's overall biomass. So if there's um, a lot of organisms, as there would be in a red tide event, um, that's going to reduce the amount of light. Now, what's more common off the West Coast, Sefi, over here? More common off the West Coast, um, well, again, you know, we could have that classic red tide. Um, but again, it could, again, color variation is a big part of it as well. Okay. So. And does the weather affect um, the red tide at all? Weather, I would say in an indirect sense, um, you know, of course, um, weather and wave action can definitely move that red tide event from one central starting location up or down the coast. So, um, but it's not to say that this event is necessarily facilitated or started by any sort of weather pattern. Okay. Well, Jonathan, I want to thank you for taking the time and talking with us. And again, if you guys have any more questions, please come to the Ocean Institute down in Dana Point Harbor. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you very much. My pleasure. We hope you enjoyed our journey through the wonderful world of red tide. And if you have any other questions, please come visit the Orange County Marine Institute here in Dana Point. See you guys next time.